Hello and welcome to the last The Nutritionist webinar of the 2020 season. We have our final of two presentations on dairy goats. We're joined today by Dr. Andreas Voskolos of the University of Thessaly and Dr. Tom Tuluki of AMTS. We're pleased also to have Sean Lee from AnsiTech, our China distributor, join as a co-host later. Dr. Andreas Voskolos is an assistant professor in animal science at the University of Thessaly where he conducts research with an emphasis in cow breeding and a focus on environmental pollution mitigation strategies. A Greek native, he graduated from the Department of Animal Production at Theologi Technological Institute Larissa. Afterwards, he completed his MSc studies at an in animal science at Vajeningen University, his PhD with Professor Sergio Calcimia at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He worked as a postdoc researcher at Cornell University under Professor Michael Van Amberg's supervision. There, his research field focused on dairy cow nutrition, improving the CNCPS, while he participated in several in vitro and in vivo trials. From 2015 to 2019, he worked as a research fellow at Aberystwyth University, Wales, focusing on dairy cow precision nutrition. This second of two webinars focusing on dairy goats will look at feeding the dairy goat. Dr. Foskalos will provide guidelines on feeding for production. He will also discuss working in the small ruminant model in AMTS Farm. Tom is joining us to field questions specific to model inputs. We are very pleased with the response to these two special goat webinars to encourage everyone feeding small ruminants to try out the program and incorporate some of what you learned today, we are offering a free trial from now until January 31st, 2021. For those of you who already have dot cattle, we are turning on the small ruminants model, module. For those who have not yet trialed, we encourage you to go to our website and download amts.cattle. <laughs> Um, and small ruminants. If you've previously trialed but did not purchase, you will need to conduct us, contact us for a retrial. Um, we'll give you more details in a slide at the end of the webinar. Um, we're now going to turn on the mic and have Andreas start and he will take over control of the screen. I am hopeful that I have set it all up so that you can just start sharing your screen instead of mine. Okay. Hello, Marianne. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, not many mistakes today, so I will not correct your, uh, your pronunciation. So <laughs> you did a better job, okay? So you need to stop sharing screen for me, please. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes? Yes, very good. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Okay, so hello everybody. We will start now with the, the second uh, seminar, let's say the webinar. Uh, we will speak more detail about feeding the dairy goat. I received a lot of questions from you and a nice feedback on the pool that we I sent you the previous time. So the approach today is to give some formulation details, trying to get a, a guideline for feeding the goats. But then I would like to have an interaction with you. And if you want, we can put the model on the screen and start playing. Because at the end of the day, playing with the diets, playing with the response of the model is what will give us a feedback to see the, the theory, the literature, and, and, and try to find out what is going on. So in the previous talk, we had a general overview of the dairy goat systems, especially in Europe, in the Mediterranean. And I asked you to fill this questionnaire, and you did. 50% of you were from Europe, and another 50% were from uh, America. Several countries, okay, in Europe, Greece, Italy, UK, Netherlands, Spain, France, most of these countries, they have pretty strong goat. Uh, production, but also Germany and Ireland. From the States, we had Canada, USA, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Chile. So it was a pretty good distribution of, uh, of countries there. Uh, 
most of you were male. This is something that I didn't like. We need to make an effort and bring more women into the, in the field, okay? And goats are suitable for this. I mean, it's not a dairy cow. A lot of women can, uh, can work with goats. So we need to be more attractive on this. Uh, the age distribution was quite normal, okay? Most of you were between the 26 and 35, some until 45, like in my age, but the whole distribution was pretty good. Animal scientists were 40, 35%, and then we had veterinarians or students and other nutritionists. So someone that defined himself as a nutritionist uh, probably wasn't an animal scientist or a veterinarian, or it was one of these two things. Uh, the interest in most of you was nutrition and then management, of course, 82% nutrition. This is quite surprising, no? even though we are talking about nutrition uh, webinars. And the preferences of what we are going to discuss in this uh, session, in this uh, webinar, were quite clear. Diet formulation was the first choice for most of you, okay, more than 85-90%. And the second concern was also in diet formulation about concentrate feeding, TMR feeding, how we can feed better the cow, so the, the goat. And the system preference was quite heavily for intensive systems. So today we are going to talk about feeding the dairy goat in intensive systems. As I said in the first time, when we define an intensive system, we need to have in mind that it's a high input, high output. We have specific breeds that they, I call them in industrialized, that very suitable to do uh, in, in, in an industrial scale production. We talk about large, mainly medium to large farms, and there is a high degree of mechanizations, like these are the farms that we can feed the TMR, for example. So what I'm going to talk today, I will start to speak about some unique aspects in uh, the dairy goat nutrition. And this is mainly a feedback from your questions, the questions that you send me. And the, most of you, what they wanted to say is that what you wanted to hear was a guideline of what type of nutrients, how much, how far, how low, how high we can go in each one of them. We will define the seminar goat and since it is an intensity system, this, even though I like these pictures, this, this will not be our goat. And then we will go to diet formulation. So unique aspects of dairy goats or specific aspects, let's say, okay? The maintenance energy requirements as a percentage are higher than uh, those in dairy cows, okay? Uh, some of you also sent me uh, a question about this, that the dairy cow weighs 700 kilograms while the goat is 10 times less, okay? It's around 70 uh, kilograms. When we calculate the maintenance energy requirements, and here I use the equations from Indra, we don't use the body weight, but we use the metabolic body weight. And this changes a lot the calculation. So if we do this calculation here with these body weights, you will realize that the metabolizable energy, it will be around 19.7 megacals per day for a cow and 2.6 megacals per day for a goat. What we are trying to say here is that, yes, the body weight is 10 times less, but the energy requirements as a whole is 7.4 times less. So in total, the energy requirements of the goat are more compared with cows, and this has to do with the body weight of the animal. The retention time in the rumen is slower. Okay, and this is because the passage rate is higher. And if we get this amazing equation, the ones that the one equation that Tom says that we should never forget when we speak about nutrition, since the passage rate is higher, okay, the whole degradation of the same feedstuff it will be lower. And this is something that we need to have in mind. The dry matter intake of the goat is much higher compared with cows. So if we have a cow that the dry matter intake will be like two to 3% of the body weight in goats, it's, it is much higher. It can be up to 5%. And in high producing goats, it can be more than 5%. 
that's a benefit that we have from from working with goats. Uh, one of the problem is that with, this is the, what we know from the literature, okay, that the goats are less sensitive in body weight and body condition score changes. So, in traditional systems, in low input, low output systems, we don't want to have a big meta mobilization of uh, fat. So we don't want to have big differences in body condition score. I don't think now that this is 100% true. Okay, this is what we are used to. This is how we formulate diets for extensive systems. But if we see the literature, this is the typical work with cows. Okay, and we see that in the first 25, 30 days, the cow will lose on a live weight scale about one kilo. And of course, this is the, the fat that is going to mobilize and cover the energy demand during the negative energy balance. And we have a huge drop of body condition score. Okay, now if we do the calculations, we will see that the cow is going to lose 3.6 of her weight during the first three, 30 days. The recent data on high producing dairy goats, and I'm taking the work of Indra, says that in body weight, not in body condition score, unfortunately they didn't have data for that, the goats are losing a lot during the first 25 days. And this is like 8.75% of their body weight. And I can assume that most of this refers to fat and not to the whole body weight, okay? So let's put in question this and let's think, I, I, did, I cannot find in the literature a lot of data on this. Unfortunately, research with dairy goats is very limited. There are a lot of things that we can do that we should do. Uh, but I think that these improved breeds that we are talking now, the intensive breeds, they are not as sensitive as we think. Okay, and probably we can use these body condition losses during the transition period in order to cover the milk production. One thing that is sure is that the goats don't have the same uh, bite force. Okay, the goats ruminate more, about 9 to 16% higher compared with uh, dairy cows and this is why we need to have a reduction of the particle size okay and you see the numbers that we are using in Greece these are from textbook these are the reference uh, values that when we speak about forage it should be less than 1.2 millimeters 20 percent of the forage between 1.2 and 0.3 should be 60 percent and higher, actually, no, lower, this is correct, than 0.3 millimeters should be the 20% of the forage. Again, now I'm talking about forage, not the whole diet. Something that we do know, especially when goats are on, on pasture, is that they're more selective than cows, okay? So sorting is higher. And someone asked, how can we reduce sorting when we feed TMR? Okay, but in this case, we need to have in mind that the TMR is a way to reduce sorting. Okay, and if we do it correctly, most of the time, of the times, we don't have extended sorting with dairy goats. How can we further improve this? I mean, that's that's quite simple. We can use the same strategies that we have with uh, dairy cows. Okay, most two two factors are very important here: the particle size of the TMR and the dry matter of the TMR. So the particle size, we have the recommendations here for the forage. And now we have to look what's going on with the dry matter of the TMR. And the problem is here is that a lot of people are feeding uh, haze as the basic forage. And the question is how we can get the TMR dry matter into a normal range, okay? First factor that we need to see is the quality of forage, especially the dry matter when we are feeding uh, silages. The second part is the mixing properties. So each feeding wagon has um, has specific uh, instructions on how to operate, but at the same time, and this is something that we always forget in farms, is the maintenance of the feeding wagon, the knives, if they are sharp, if they can cut correctly, etc. This is something that we need to see, especially in farms that sorting is quite high. And then 
we do need to use in, uh, in dairy goats, molasses, water, and other wet byproducts in the concentrate in order to get the dry matter of the TMR into a range between 45 and 60. If we do this, sorting will not be a problem with dairy goats. Now, the, the nutrients and the inclusion rate, this is what everybody was asking. How we can start thinking about that? What is the main element? I think we should start from NDF. And we should answer the very simple question, how low is too low? All of us, we would like to reduce NDF in order to increase the nutrient content of the TMR, of the diet that we are feeding the goats. In extensive or semi-intensive systems, the NDF content is very high can be between 40 and 55, and there is a lot of research out there that use NDF range between 40 and 55, which is very high in intensive systems. Why? Because this will limit energy intake, and this will limit milk production, okay? So if you have a goat that is not producing much, you don't really care, you want to feed here a lot of NDF, but if you go to a Zanen or an Alpine, and you go to intensive systems, you want to maximize milk yield. So how low can we go? That's the big question because we need to increase all the other nutrients that they are important, but without affecting milk fat and without affecting the health of the rumen. Okay, big questions. I don't know if we can answer them directly. Let's get on the theory. Uh, theoretically, we know that when we are close to energy balance or even we increase it okay the milk fat as a percentage here will re be reduced okay that's something that we know quite well we also know that when we lower the ndf content the milk total solids will increase okay the lower ndf the higher will be the total solids not the percentage of fat in the diet in the in milk but total solids and this comes because we are increasing uh, milk yield and this is more characteristic here when we talk about the ratio between crude protein and NDF, the lower is the NDF and higher the crude protein, the higher is the total milk solids, okay? Again, all these do not differentiate between intensive and extensive systems. They don't differentiate between high producing or low producing goats. A work that I liked in Indra is that they are trying to correlate a lot of things with the proportion of concentrate in the diet, which is another big factor here. When we don't feed concentrate at all, at 0%, then we have a specific dry matter intake and a specific milk yield. Of course, when we start to feed concentrate, dry matter increases for a while, but milk yield increases quite a lot. And we have situations, and I have some examples later on, that we go up to 60% concentrate in the diet. What this will affect will affect the production and again now i speak about production and not a percentage of fat or protein in milk okay because i think it's a better a better way to 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 think about it and we have an increase in protein increase in lactose but the fat is not responding in the same way when we increase the concentrate okay it will get an optimum around 20 30 percent of concentrate and then it will drop so in the literature, we don't have a lot of studies with goats. We don't. We are not 100% sure to say this is the ratio and this is not. This is how much we can include or not. We don't have challenging treatments so far, meaning with very low. I'm sorry, someone is chatting. Uh, I will answer later to this. Okay. Uh, and someone asked. Andreas, about, we'll take questions at the end. Yes, okay. But, uh, yes, someone is. Uh, you can continue texting and I will check it again, okay? Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and I'll read those to you so everybody can okay. see them because okay. I'm not sure okay. they all do. Okay, so someone asked about UNDF and how we use it in, uh, in goats. We never investigated UNDF in goats. This is a pretty new concept, even for dairy cattle. So in science, we can say that we need to do a lot of things more and we need to generate data, but at the same time, we need to feed the goats. And what we see in practice probably can be a very good guide for us. 
Uh, for sure, we need the uh, NDF more than 30, 32%. We cannot go less than 28 or 26 as we do with dairy cows. And something that is very important is that the forage NDF should be more than 75 of total NDF. This will help us to answer the second question, how high is too high for starch and sugar? And the main problem here is acidosis, but usually we talk about SARA, okay? And a lot of people are suggesting that this should not be described as subacute ruminal acidosis, but as the high concentrate syndrome. The more concentrate we feed, the more response we have in rumen pH. I'm not going to, to get into the middle of all these discussions. I think both things are very, very important. We need to, uh, to balance around it. The main thing here with goats is that we need to increase the inclusion rate of concentrate because this is the only way to increase milk yield, okay? So in practice, we have seen starts level between 15 and 25, okay, with not big problems with acidosis. Sugar should be more than five. A lot of people are not willing to feed sugars on dairy goats. I don't understand why. And then non-fiber carbohydrates can be between 30 and 45. So if we put all this together and try to get guidelines, Crude protein in most of the rations, it is between 15 and 17, and it can be lower depending on the sources of protein that we are using. We need to have a good rumen nitro ammonia balance. That's for sure, about 110, 120. This is the same for cows and goats. NDF coming from forage, more than 75%. The NDF of the diet, and this is something that we see quite frequently in intensive systems between 30 and 38, or even 29 in some cases. Starch can be as high as 25%. Sugar, I always have more than four, around five and six. non foreign carbohydrates, as I said, at 45. And the fat, we also can include fat in these diets, around three to 5%. So let's define the seminar goat, the goat that we will start playing with in the, in the model. Okay, we said about the industrial breeds, excuse me, this high I call them, the improved breeds. And I, in the previous um, webinar, I gave you a lot of information about breeds. We are talking in this case mainly about Zanen and Altin. Body weights are different, and we have to take this into consideration. They can be up to 80 kilograms of body weight Zanen, up to 70, the Alpines. Milk productions are the same level, like 900, 950 kilograms per year. In almost 300 milking days. So this gives you an estimation of milk yield per day at 3.2 or 3 kilos. Fat percentage in these breeds is not pretty high, it's around 3.5 and milk protein 3.3. So I would like to get a range of values in order to start formulating. And this is, I think the best way to do it is through the lactation curve. This is a pretty old uh, data from even 30 years ago, but the equation is one of the equations that we use today. So for Alpines and Zanen, they calculated these constants. Let me explain them a little bit. A is the initial milk yield, B is the slope that we have in the first stage of the lactation, and C is the second part, okay? So what I did just to, to play a little bit with, because if we follow these instructions, we are talking about right, and a goat that existed 30 years ago, but not now. The area under the curve is only 362 kilograms, and we need a goat that will be around 950. So in this case, I didn't want to change the shape of the, of the lactation curve, so the only thing that I changed was the initial milk yield, and if you start to increase the initial milk yield, you will get a response like this, and for a cow, for a goat that's producing 950 kilograms, you have a lactation like this. So this means like lactation curve like this, it means like the daily milk yield that we can get from this goat is maximum five kilos and around three as an average. So this helped me to get values in these uh, seminar goats that we are going to use later on, and we can play between two and five kilograms of milk per day. So we go to diet formulation, and we know that in, in dairy goats, we are using two systems, the two parts diet and the TMR, okay? So 
the two-part diets has one recipe, let's say, one part of the diet is the basic diet that will have the maintenance requirements, and the second part will be the supplement. A lot of people are feeding that at the parlor. And the TMR that we have one mixed ratio that is going to be fed not at the parlor, but at the feeders. Both of them have positives and positive and negatives, okay? The positives here is that we are talking about low investment, you don't need to pay the, the, the mixing wagon. You don't need to pay all the other things. Uh, and then you can feed the coach based on their actual milk yield, okay? Either in groups or individually. Individually in big farms is quite difficult, but in small farms it can, be, it can happen. What we have as a negative here is that we have a high risk of SARA because we are feeding a lot of concentrate at one specific time point of the day or two time points of the day. We have decreased labor cost. And in this case, we can have a sorting behavior from the goat. When we feed the TMR, we have a unimorph feeding, okay? Me sorting is minimized, reduced risk of SARA and labor cost. But at the same time, we need to invest in the equipment in order to make the TMR. And we need to invest in also in our barns in order to have group formation. I mean, feeding one TMR in different groups makes no sense, okay? We need to have several... Uh, TMRs there in one farm. Okay, I will start with the first one, which is the basic supplement, okay? The basic will cover the requirements for maintenance of the animal plus one kilogram of milk. And we have two strategies there, one to do it with 100% of forage, but in this case, we need to have in mind that we need forages that will provide energy as well. So this is mainly corn silage. Or we can have a strategy with forage and concentrate. And in this case, we will feed forage to get the protein needs. And then we will get uh, concentrate to meet the energy requirements of the animal. Okay, there are two different strategies. In both cases, we will feed a supplement. And a lot of people are buying this supplement from, uh, from feeding companies. And we have different ways to make a supplement depending on the milk to feed uh, ratio, okay? So we can feed one kilo of this supplement and get 2.25 uh, kilograms of milk or two or 1.75. So it depends on the supplements that we are going to formulate or the supplement that we are going to buy. Okay, so let's get in this case and I will define the goals here. This is the first step to formulate, okay? Define the goal that we have. I change a lot of things from what it has already the model. Uh, milk production for this, for the basic, the maintenance is only one kilo. Okay, we changed the body weight here. I did not touch the body condition score and the body condition score target. And mainly we are talking about the goat that's producing four kilos. And in the first case, we are going to meet the requirements for maintenance plus one kilo of production. And in the second step, we are going to make a concentrate in order to get also these four kilos of uh, production. Okay, this is a, a diet, okay? Quite common in this case. As I said, we need to have forages that will bring both energy and protein. So we need to feed corn silage. There is no other way to do it. And the most commonly used feed here is uh, alfalfa hay as a protein source. So with 3.5 kilograms in uh, as fed base, 0.3 alfalfa and 0.2 straw, a typical diet, 100% forage. We can meet the demands of this animal for energy and protein. Actually, we are overfeeding a little bit of protein in this case. This doesn't matter because later on we will correct it. And if we see the CNCPS tool, uh, we have the NDF quite high, okay, it's 50%. Starts is 21% because of the corn silage. Uh, and we have a pretty good balance in the rumen between mainly this is what I'm, I'm trying to see, that the ammonia balance will be satisfied, okay? So if we have this case, then we need a supplement, okay? And a typical supplement can be this one, made from corn grain, wheat bar, bran, Soybean meal, of course, I add some molasses here, minerals and vitamins, and also some fat, 
Okay, I know that minerals and vitamins are quite low. This is not the, the amount that we are used to. Uh, so in this case, we go back here. We feed 1.36 because the, the relationship of the concentrate is almost 2.25. And we are pretty close to meet the demands. Okay, but I, I took a concentrate that we can see in the in the market quite frequently okay quite and it is considered a good one because it has a relationship of 2.25 again here we have some imbalances that they are mainly driven by the dry matter intake so i think that the predicted dry matter intake that's my personal opinion uh, under predicts a little bit the actual dry matter intake of the gold and this is a big question and we always have it when we try to evaluate uh, diets for goats and, and cows that the dry matter intake should be an input. Okay, we need to know the specific herd, how much or the specific group, what the dry matter intake is in order to use that as an input for the model and not rely in the predicted dry matter intake. So the difference here is pretty low. If I add from this instead of 1.36, we make it 1.4 then of course we are going to meet the needs. The total ratio has an NDF of 33.3, .3, so it's much higher than uh, we said in the beginning. Starch and sugar are around 35, and that's good. Not much sugars here, a lot of starch, of course. 45% of uh, fermentable calf carbohydrates as a percentage of dry matter. Excuse me. And we overfeed a little bit ammonia in the rumen with this concentrate. Okay. Now, if we have the same goats with a second strategy to create a basic diet from forage and concentrate, we will see a lot of differences here. Okay. So if we go in this strategy, and this is something typical that we do in, in dairy goats, we use only alfalfa hay as the main forage and straw. Okay, so we will put alfalfa hay, straw, and we need to get energy. And what we use can be wheat flour or corn, grain. And if we put 0 0.475 grams per day, we will get quite close in the dry matter intake, dry matter intake the prediction. And we will see that, yes, the forage in this case is only 70%. Okay, it's not as the previous one, 100%. We meet the, the, the protein demands more than required, okay? We are feeding 137% of the requirements. We cannot do something different. K, alfalfa K is the main forage here. We cannot feed them straw, okay? And we lack a little bit of energy. So if in this case, we have, yes, okay, this is the, the CNCPS analysis, and in this case, we have quite good balance for starch and sugar. NDF is still quite high because 70% of the diet is forage. What we see is that the ammonia balance in the rumen is not satisfied. But this has a reason. It has the reason that we added a lot of energy in the grain. Bacterial protein was maximized 75.3%. So finally, we gave to these bugs the energy to produce more. Okay. And we have a negative balance here. If we supplement this diet, this basic recipe with the same concentrate that we had at the beginning, okay, and in the same amount, 1.36 kilos per day in gold, we will clo be close in meeting the energy requirements. We will overfeed protein, okay, 108%. We don't feed as much energy as we should. The forage to concentrate ratio is only 40%, 40 to 60, okay? So we don't feed a lot of forage here in this uh, case. And the forage NDF is more than 75%. So this is something that we satisfy. But here we have the risk of feeding a low forage diet. 
from uh, CNCPS analysis, the tool that we have here, the feed analysis will be like 30%, 29.6 for NDF, quite close to what we said at the beginning. Starch and sugar will be quite high, okay? Um, yes, and here we meet the requirements for ammonia because of the supplement, okay? So if we have these two strategies, and then we use one supplement for both cases, and this is something that we see quite often in the, from the industry. Usually the industry, what they do is, the feeding industry, they have a concentrate, they call it lactation mix or cake or whatever, it, and they will not differentiate the mix based on what the main forage is. That's why I gave you this example, that's why I, I added all these imbalances because in most of the cases, when we go with commercial mix and when we try to have the same supplement just in the base of this relationship and not of the rest that we are having as a strategy, we will find out that there are many imbalances, okay? What is the alternative and how we can deal with that is to have two different supplements. And this is what I'm trying here in Greece to convince a lot of companies that they cannot provide only one supplement, but they should provide a supplement based on the main forage. If the main forage here is corn silence and here is hay, the supplement should not be the same, even if the relationship of milk to feed is the same. Okay, so we need different supplements to meet, to meet the demands in these different uh, feeding strategies. Let's go to the TMR now. Okay, I will add, just to make it a little bit more challenging, I will add another cow, another goat, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, the same body weight, but higher production it will be around five kilograms per day. This is a TMR. Okay, so we have corn silage as forage, but also hay, lower amount. We don't need that much protein. We will get it from uh, the other ingredients. Uh, wheat bran corn grain fine, molasses, of course, and now we are introducing, besides the soybean meal, we introduce soy pass. A high-producing goat needs soy pass. When you maximize the rumen, when you maximize the microbial protein synthesis, then you need something to overcome it. And with a goat that is producing five liters of milk per day, then you need to give a better feed in order to overcome the, the limitations of of the rumen by just feeding the soybean meal, okay? And here we have a balanced recipe. We have, we meet the requirements, we meet the requirements for energy and for protein. The dry matter intake is close, okay? So if the goat is going to produce five kilos, she has to eat more, okay? That's normal, this is how the equation works here and this is how the reality works. Dry matter intake is a relationship of body weight plus milk production. And if we see the whole TMR, we will see that it's much more balanced, 30% the NDF. Sugars and starch are a little bit higher than 35, that is that they have to be together. Again, this is a risk here, we need to have it in mind. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, okay. So that was, that was the presentation. I'm sorry, the last slide I, It's from the previous uh, webinar. So what, what I would like to do now, come on. Okay, what I would like to do now is to see some of the discussions that you are sending and play with the model itself. Okay, and make this webinar more interactive. What do you think? That's, that seems good. I'm Andreas, I want to, I have a few housekeeping details that I just need to go over really quickly. Before we open the floor for questions, I need to cover a few items. We've been working very hard on scheduling for the 2021 The Nutritionists, and I'm very pleased to say we have a full and confirmed roster of speakers and topics lined up for the next season. For those of you who are perhaps first-time attendees, we run these multinational webinars on the second Thursday of the month, February through December. Our talks 
Next year, we'll diverge from the standard head and shoulders lecture type presentations. We decided to step away from the desk and take the entire season into the barn. Our speakers were chosen for their applied focus. You can see our presenters are selected to showcase a range of global perspectives with speakers from the USA, Canada, South Africa, Italy, Brazil, and the UK. Make sure you join us next year. And to get on that list, email webinars at agmodelsystems.com. And for one last time, I want to thank our generous sponsors from 2020 that made it possible for us to get speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm & Hammer Animal Health, makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy cow health, and the Canola Council of Canada. Learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com. Our silver sponsors were Ajinomoto Heartland, superior nutrition through amino acids, makers of Agipro L, Dairyland Laboratories, and Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s. Our bronze sponsors are Dairy One Forge Laboratory, Amino Max, Adiseo, Purdue Agribusiness, PMI, and Soychlor. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope that you consider them in your formulation decisions. And finally, before I open the floor up for questions, I want to remind you that we are offering the small ruminants module for free from now until January 31st, 2021. For all of those who already are running amts.cattle, we are turning the small ruminants model on for you. For those of you who have not yet trialed, we encourage you to go to our website and download amts.farm.cattle and small ruminants. If you have previously trialed but did not purchase, you'll need to contact us so that we can set you up for a retrial. You can either email me or you can email support at agmodelsystems.com. Now, finally, we'll get to the questions and the discussion. Um, I want to just switch back and let Andreas take over from here. So um, not meaning to take up much time. Go ahead. And I've given you um, the ability to share your screen. Okay, thank you. So this is the model, okay? You sent several questions. Yeah, shall we get started on questions? Yes, do you want me to? to I'll, I'll to read, read them to you. Um, and some of these you've probably already answered, but we'll make sure that uh, it gets, it gets okay. um, solidified. So one of the first questions that came in is um, with regards to the lab values for NDF digestion, can you use the 12, 30, 120, 240 hours that are analyzed by commercial labs given the different rate of passage for, for sheep and goats or is that as best as we have? Okay, so what I said in the, in the beginning and I think that confused people is that the passage rate is different, okay? Now, uh, we do have studies that they say that also the degradation rate is different, but it is really impossible to generate table values, for example, for all these feedstuffs that the CNCPS has or all the other models have, just with lumen liquid, lumen fluid from goats and two specific in vitro uh, analysis to get the degradation rate of, for goats. So most all models what are using are the degradation rates that we obtain with rumen fluid from cows. And we don't have a lot of mistake here, to be honest. Okay, so we can guess, the answer is yes, we can and we should use uh, the NDF degradation as we do with cows, like with the time points and everything. Okay. By the way, I'm sorry if I, I interrupt, but uh, when we speak about CNCPS, we talk about ANDFOM always. Okay, I didn't, I didn't want to do, I, I think that everybody knows that we are speaking about ANDFOM, not just NDF. Yeah, um, we, we actually had this discussion, Lynn and I, this past week, that in the model, anytime NDF is referenced, it's actually intended that it is ANDFOM. 
Okay. Um, we'll, I'll stick with that same questioner and then we'll move on. Um, what fat source works best with goats? Um, C16, zero and rich C16, zero to C18, zero or calcium salts. Uh, we don't have data for that. I, I don't have data for that. I don't know. And uh, we just started now to use fat in dairy goats. I don't think we need to differentiate between them. Okay. For now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question in the questions. How is this system related to the small ruminants nutrition system that was based on CNCS? Is, and Carol, is that meant to be CNCPS? I'm sorry. I think it's CNCPS, the small. I do, I do so, too. So let, let's see. When we spoke about, speak about the small ruminant nutrition system, and probably Tom can help us with this. Yeah, uh, do you want me to answer that? Yes, yes please. please. Okay. So... The, the small ruminant nutrition system um, was originally 100% uh, part of, of the CNCPS. Uh, when Antonello Canis uh, was working on his PhD at Cornell, that's when he developed that side. Um, and unfortunately, uh, in the last 10 years or so, uh, more than that, 15 years, uh, as the improvement to especially the supply side of, of, the, CNC, of the CNCPS, including the, the degradation rates, the, the, the NDF time points, uh, and a whole bunch of other things that, that have been uh, improved uh, within the core biology. Those were never implemented in the small ruminant nutrition system. Uh, the, the small ruminant nutrition system is still basically CNCPS version five uh, biology in terms of the rumen. Uh, so when, when we built the, this small ruminant model, uh, we, we, we took um, a lot of the requirements would be that we calculate would be similar to what the small ruminant nutrition system uh, predicts. Uh, I did do some uh, uh, changes to that uh, based on some of some newer data. Uh, so a combination of, of INRA, uh, uh, ARC, AFRC out of Australia, uh, the, the latest uh, small ruminant NRC, uh, and, and then for the supply side, fully implemented what is the current CNCPS rumen with the exception of the passage rate equations where it went back and are using uh, Antonello's passage rate equations. So, so you can think of, of this model as the next generation of, of the small ruminant model. Thank, thank you, Tom. <laughs> um, I'm gonna tackle a couple questions about particle size that we had yes, early in the yes. presentation. Um, the recommendations for roughage particle size, he's guessing that the millimeters is not the correct mm. unit and it should, should it be in centimeters or inches. And no. I'm going to um, yeah. lump this sort of together. Mm -hmm. If rumination activity in goat is up to 16% higher compared to cows, why does the particle size of the feed have to be lower? I would presume the opposite. Okay, yes. So the first thing is that the recommendations are correct and it says higher than 1.2. 20% of the diet of the forest should be higher than 1.2. Okay, so this means that the, you will have large particles there as well. But the majority of the forest should be chopped quite fine. Now, about rumination is indeed higher because they have difficulties uh, to, to chew the feed. If you have large particles in the feed, they will have to bring them more times and ruminate more, and they have to chew them more, and they have a lot more bites. Okay? If we want to help them in order to have a higher degradation of the feed, because they also have a higher passage rate, then you need to play with that and help them to digest the feed faster, because we want to have them increase their dry matter intake and produce more 
So why, why, I don't understand why it should be the opposite. I think it was quite clear, rumination is higher because they cannot chew the feed as efficient as the dairy cows. So we reduce the particle size of the forage in order to help them eat more. Okay, um, while we're on particle size, we have, we have a little bit of a debate going on mm -hmm. as well as some questions. So um, first we'll go through the questions. Um, do you recommend whole corn or ground corn? Ground and corn. Ground corn, and do you worry, do you do a meal or pelleted and do you need to worry about fines with a meal? Yeah, we can pellet it as well. And there are a lot of uh, farms here that they are not feeding uh, forage in the sense that we have at all. They are feeding uh, also alfalfa pellets. And then you have a pellet for, or a pellet or a powder for the, from the, the concentrate. Okay. Um, so regarding the particle size, and I'm assuming we're, we're um, perhaps some have some recommendations of someone mm -hmm. who has some direct experiences. He says goats will not consume short card of particle size and whole corn is better for goats than ground corn. So. Yes, I don't agree with that. I mean, if you have a TMR, they will consume it and they will have no problem. If you have a pellet, they will eat it with no problem. If you have them in the two parts diet, then yes, they are you might be because the sorting there is higher then yes you might be a little bit careful with that but again I'm, 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 we are speaking about intensive systems here we are speaking about goats that they produce four five six liters of milk so we have to treat them with a different way what we know from a traditional system should not be applied in an intensive system very good thank you thank you for um making that distinction. Um, I'm looking through these. We do there have is, some questions. I'm sorry. There is a good one saying that if the dairy sheep has higher maintenance energy, it is exactly the same with, uh, with goats because they are smaller. So the example that I gave had to do with the body weight of the animal and how we calculate the maintenance energy from the metabolic body weight. So the same principle holds also for dairy sheep. Thank you. Yes, that, that was, um, we are hoping next, next year to um, get some, some similar type sp speaking, um, present presenters on dairy sheep. So um, anybody that might have some experience and suggestion with that, and perhaps Andreas, you again, um, will, we would be very interested in, in having a couple more special webinars that are focused not on dairy cows, but on the other dairy animals. Um, I want to move a little bit to um, MUNs and also some discussion of amino acids and um, recommendations are for in that area. So I guess, could you talk a little bit about amino acids and then talk some about um, the questions we have about NUNs? Okay, so I think the problem that we have with goats and sheep is that we don't really have recommendations for amino acids. Uh, I'm talking about dairy animals here and the recommendations are not, are not quite good. I mean, we don't really have a recommendation for that. This is something that I discussed also with Tom the previous time that we need to develop some uh, studies and see the exact amino acid recommendations, okay? Depending on the system that we are going to use, we will have the corresponding amino acid recommendations. But we don't have, I cannot say something about that. We don't really have good recommendations for uh, amino acids. Okay, thank you. Um which this is a question from a nutritionist in Italy which milk urea nitrogen do you consider normal in dairy goats I don't think we we get into the level that we have with uh, dairy cows in this case we don't have uh, recommendations about milk urea nitrogen I don't think we are looking uh, aspects of nitrogen metabolism and nitrogen pollution if you want with the same way that we look at that dairy cows so far Okay, thank you. Um, are there concerns with feeding corn silage in goats in terms of mycotoxins? 
I mean, as long as the corn silage is good, we don't need to worry, but we have the same problems, let's say theoretical problems with the, with the cows. Here is something that we can say that it is the same, yes. But we don't, we don't need to be, we don't need to afraid to put corn silage to goats because of that. Okay, and um, while we're on silages, critical amounts of butyric acid in corn silage or um, the dry matter percentage of that corn silage? So the dry matter percentage, is, it's the, we have the same recommendations with goats, it will be like 35%. Butyric acid, we don't want butyric acid in corn silage, that's, that's for sure. If it has a high butyric acid, we should not feed it to, to dairy goats or dairy cows. Okay. <laughs> Um, there was a question early on about um, the NDF in intake of goats in pasture. Yes, I saw that. I, I, I don't know. I cannot okay. answer that. I mean, right. generally, when we have goats on pasture, the NDF, it's pretty much higher. It's like 40, 45%. It can be up to 55%, depending on the level of production. It's much higher compared to the intensive systems that I saw. I saw this to this day. Okay. Um, Heat stress. So discussing particle size, and there's a couple um, couple responses in the questions. Are there pen shaker box recommendations? This is um, for the U.S. That no, um, I don't think I don't think there are recommendations for that made. No. Okay. I don't know if if Tom knows, he can jump in. I I don't I don't know if they have if we have any recommendations for. for no, I system. don't know of any. All right, Robert Von Son is with us and he um, maybe, he said he used um, the Penn State separator and he said it suggests that goats sort TMR and selecting against both long particles and fine particles. Perhaps he'll jump in with a comment and or question. Sound, okay. It sounds like he has some good answer, good experience. Um, I'm jumping around, so I'm trying to see where I'm at. How do dairy goat requirements and rations compare with, and this person said meat sheep. Um, I'm wondering meat sheep, meat, meat goats. No, meat, meat sheep. Okay, what was the question? Because I cannot find it in the chat. Okay, it's in the chat. How do um, dairy goat requirements or rations compare with meat sheep or meat goats? I think they are totally different, no? I mean, practically in Greece, we don't have any meat goats or meat uh, <laughs> uh, meat sheep. We it's all dairy. I'm not the right okay. person to answer this. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, what are the differences in the the rumen um, ability of saturated versus unsaturated fats? Again, I don't think we have the data to, to answer that. Okay. That's, that's always the problem when we speak with people that they have all this knowledge from dairy cows and they try to implement it in dairy goats or in sheep, is that we don't have studies to answer. Right. That's good for us, the scientist is good, if, as long as we have funding <laughs> and we can do some research. Uh, but the, the truth is that the dairy cow is really progress the nutrition in dairy cow and we cannot implement everything that we know right now a, from a dairy cow point of view to dairy goats. Okay. Um, adaptations for the heat stress. Adaptation you... for the heat stress. So dairy goats, they tolerate heat stress better than any other animal. Okay. And uh, we don't have specific adaptations for heat stress actually. We, I, most of the times we don't need it. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just sorting through these. Um, how, um, is there any issue, are there any issues with grass tetany or milk fever in goats? I don't, I don't think so, I don't know. Okay. Um, this is just a comment, the NRA data shows that goats are much more tolerant of unsaturated fats. Um, BH theory applies less. Okay, I don't, I don't know that. Danielle, oh. I'm sorry. 
Um, next question, thoughts on the ability of goats to handle fast starch versus um, the way that cows do, wheat, barley, corn, et cetera? Uh, they can handle fast starts with, I mean, uh, I would. comparative physiology between uh, goats and cows, no? I think they can handle fast starts easily. Uh, theoretically speaking, they are not so sensitive in acidosis as uh, cows. Okay. Do you have recommendations that are specific for lactating goats at first kitty? What, what type of uh, recommendations? Like uh, the percentage of the of starch and NDF in the diet? I mean, the main <laughs> point here with first kidding goats is that they are going to have less milk yield. And this will make all the adjustments in the, in the diet, in the recipe. Okay. Um, question for, are there special recommendations, special diet recommendations for goats whose milk will be made into cheese? So theoretically, when we have milk that's going to be made, uh, to be used to make cheese, we want more fat in the diet. That's, that's the general recommendation. And there are a lot of people that saying, okay, don't, um, don't use Alpine or Zanen because the fat percentage is pretty low compared with other breeds. And they are talking about breed differences. But yes, we, if you have a different breed, then you have lower milk yield. So this is always the balance. And at the end of the day, the one that decides what is the best is the one that buys the milk, no? So if the you you if you deliver milk to be to prepare cheese out of that to make cheese out of that, then they will tell you I need this amount of fat in the diet. So if you cannot achieve it with a normal diet, you have to reduce the milk yield in order to get the recommendations that they have for fat. Okay. Recommendations for dry goats. I don't. I didn't prepare any recommendations for uh, dry goats. The, Generally speaking, when you put them in the dry season, the only thing that you know want to make different is the last month to feed them more in order to grow a little, little bit, to get some fat and uh, be able to, uh, to tolerate the transition period. Okay. Um, and so if passage rates are overall higher, which nice choices on bypass protein sources would have a large effect. For example, in this questioner's area, heat treated soybean meal with the digestibility um, regarding the digestibility of bypass protein can vary by 10 to 15%. So again, this is this is a modeling exercise, okay? If the degradation, if the passage rate is higher, so even from the same feed, you will have more rumen undegradable protein going through. Okay, this is something that the model can easily calculate and then it will give you how much of bypass protein you can use. Okay, um, uh, uh, an input from a uh, attendee concerning the amino acid recommendations. In row 2018 proposes the same ratio for dairy cows Yes, this is what and we do also within CLCPS. No, we are having more or less the same recommendations with cows. This doesn't mean that we have a, a research data to support this. This is what I'm saying. This is the difference. Okay, we can do more or less what we do with cows, but we don't really know if these recommendations are actually from data made with dairy goats or not. And this is a mistake that we do quite frequently with dairy goats. At the same time, this is the reality, and this is how we can we should move forward. If we don't have the data, we still need to feed these animals. Okay, and I've left this question for last for right now. We're going to um, we'll have more coming in, I'm sure. Um, and this this person asked, how do you determine amounts for each feed and diets? I think that that is really what it's getting to is what do you take into consideration when you're putting together a formulation. At least approach. that's how I'm reading it. Yes. I mean, the, the first thing we need to satisfy is the, the forage to concentrate ratio, how, many, how much forage we are going to feed. 
Okay, that's the first thing that determines the amount of its feed, no? The forage and what type of forages we have available, if it is corn silage or alfalfa. And then the second step is, and we speak only from a nutritional point of view, we don't see the economics behind it. That's that's another issue. Okay, if you see in my screen, the costs are also are, are zero in everything. I didn't take into consideration the, the cost of this diet. Okay, it's only to meet the requirements And the needs also I, I use, for example, to have the MP and ME and then to maximize microbial protein synthesis to get a good balance in rumen nitrogen and then to not to cross the limits on starch and sugar if, if this uh, an approach, let's say. How much NDF? Can, can I continue or not? Yes, I was going to, um, I think Andreas and then I'll ask as they come in but um and then if I'm not sure where you wanted to take it from here whether you wanted to I show a new one that is any recommendation on how much NDF as a percentage of body weight and goat can handle yes yes okay let's make a calculation if we have we do have diets with 55 percent of NDF okay or even with 60 percent of NDF imagine that you have a goat of 50 kilograms you can make the calculation and see how much they can tolerate they can tolerate a lot okay especially in extensive systems the main nutrient that they consume is ndf this doesn't mean that we need to apply this in intensive systems the approach in intensive system is that we reduce the ndf we increase starch and sugars in order to get milk okay um Thank you. A uh, question that maybe Tom will answer is, does the AMTS small ruminant model utilize different passage rates than are used in dairy cows? Address that. Yes, it does. It uses the equations that, that uh, uh, Antonello derived for uh, sheep and goats. Okay. Thank you. Andreas? Where would you like to go now? In I mean, I want to speak a little bit with Tom now. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay, the idea is to, to make an effort and uh, build the farm, build a recommendation farm, right? No? Yes, that would be, okay, I so, think that would help people. So, and also some of the answers that Tom gave, especially with the passage rates, it's, it's pretty important. Uh, how would you like to, to proceed on this? How we can play with the model? You, you see my screen, no? Yes. Okay, Tom, any, any idea, something that you would like to see further? I think what would be very helpful to start with, Andreas, is if you go to ration outputs, just on this diet you have right now. And then uh, somewhere on where it's like, like where you are, right click. Show all outputs. Okay. So what I, I think would be very useful to everyone is if you were to go through and look at what outputs are shown here, including the ones that aren't checked under the show column and, and, and select the ones that you feel are most appropriate for doing goat diets and then put in the min max ranges uh, that, that you recommend for those. And then we can create that, we can create that into a template specifically for, uh, for goats based upon your recommendations. And, and just to reinforce that with Tom, um, that will get sent out with any downloads and also I'll include it as a attachment to the email that I'll, I'll be sending out with the recording. Okay, so one of the things that I show is, for example, the MP supply. It's really out of, 
and this can confuse people, no? The, the range that we have in MP supply is not realistic. I think it's just from cows, probably, no? Change that, Andreas. A lot of these, a lot of these would be uh, just from cows or numbers that, that I made up on the fly to populate this. <laughs> okay, They're swags. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's a good starting point. I, I would like to ask because a lot of people are using the the EMTS to formulate the diets. What problems do they see? What uh, do they see? Because the, the other thing is that we don't have an actual evaluation of the model with uh, dairy goats. Okay, so do they see differences? So I received a question from uh, one of the uh, the emails that I received actually that. For example, the, the, it is difficult to balance from MP. For me, it was not difficult at all. Okay, that the MP, it was difficult to reach the limit, to reach the requirements of MP. And another question that I got from in the emails is that what about the uh, minerals recommendations? And that was, I forgot to speak about it. And that was, a, that is a big discussion. And I see that in Greece and in the UK when I was quite frequently, that we are feeding much more minerals that we actually need. Okay, so the model says that we need, I don't know, 100 grams. And usually if you take the mineral and vitamin concentrate from a specific company, then you have much more higher intakes of this of these nutrients. So. And what I see that in most of the case here, I, I don't, I didn't put the mineral and vitamin is empty, okay? But even with this, look for example, phosphorus, like 95% of the requirements are met because they are coming from the feeds. And what I've seen is that a lot of time the companies are not taking into account the nutrients that are coming from the feedstuffs that we are feeding the animals. So we, in most of the cases, we are overfeeding. This doesn't mean that the animals need it. Eh? I totally agree with you, Andreas. And that, that's true also with cows, but I, I've seen it more in small ruminants where the mineral concentrations are crazy high. We've even had people come back and ask, are, are these numbers correct that you have for requirements? And, and the numbers that we're using for requirements are, are based off of, of the, uh, the latest NRC for small ruminants. And most of them are factorially derived. And so research backed. And, and a lot of the, the supplementation that goes on has no biological relevance at all. Yes, I don't know if you see the second screen that I have here. This is the, the phosphorus that is coming. No, it's not. Oh, that's the soluble sol fiber. Soluble fiber, what is it? Uh, phosphorus, okay. So we are here and there is a lot of phosphorus that is coming from the feeds. How much more do we need to feed? If you take the typical vitamin and mineral mix that we find in the market, then you will feed probably two times more than the actual needs of the of the animal. Okay, so this is a lot and a lot of times we don't take into consideration how much we take from the feeds. Okay, now the other discussion here, the other point of discussion is yes, okay, have you ever analyzed your uh, your feeds on that no but uh, in this case we can rely on the data set we can rely on the table values we don't need to analyze minerals for all of our uh, ingredients okay now that, that's why i took phosphorus here so just without feeding at all 95 percent of the requirements are met it is red because the mineral and vitamin here is empty okay this is what i was trying to get yes Okay, so we get all this phosphorus from the diet, mainly from corn silage here, 43.45% of the requirements of the actual amount. So we don't need to feed more phosphorus. If we do, we need to be very careful. Okay, this doesn't mean that the animal needs it.
I don't have feedback from the audience. Okay, what about vitamins? I think that with vitamins is exactly the same thing. Okay, and that was that was obvious also with the last years that we have the problem with the vitamin uh, in the market, and the same companies that they are selling vitamins. They said, okay, we are indeed our recommendations is that we overfeed. So if you reduce 25, 30 percent, it will be okay. Do you remember that, Tom? Yep, yep. So with the vitamins here, without feeding extra vitamins in this diet, because the vitamin and mineral is empty, what are the recommendations? No, this means that we take, we don't take from the feed, Tom? Correct, we don't have we any, don't, any, yeah. We don't have from the feed in this case, problem. okay. Which, which is tricky because uh, we also get into, you know, like with alfalfa hay, how long is it stored? Uh, mm -hmm. Any of these, it, it's, we don't know. So we, we don't even try to populate the, the feed library for, for forages and grains yeah. with vitamin levels. There is one question about how we, we start everything and about the animals, okay? So everything and if we want to to formulate they will start from the inputs that we have okay i remember the nice slide of tom saying trust in trust out okay so if you if you garbage in garbage out actually okay so the body weight it's very important because the body weight is going to define the requirements is going to define the dry matter intake okay the maintenance need and everything and we need to to weigh our animals okay and with goats and sheep it's pretty easy you don't need the big scale that you have for uh, dairy cows okay it's much smaller and you can weigh like 10 15 percent of your animals once every one or two months and you can have a very very accurate input here into the model then okay okay um andreas i have a question about um TMR and pellets. Mm -hmm. So yes. does he feel it's necessary for always to always use a pellet for a protein source or um, adding a product like soy pass would be added as a straight ingredient? This person so, is sometimes seen it as a pellet. Yes. Um, binders I, get mm -hmm. added as a goal to make a good pellet, not for the nutrition. Yes, I didn't say that we need to have uh, everything in pellet. I didn't say that. I mean, I say that even forage now, it can come in, in pellets. Okay, a TMR can be uh, the forage, and then if you take the concentrate from a company that is a pellet, you can use it, okay? Th at that point, sorting will be higher. But what I had in mind was the typical TMR that is not for the concentrates that you don't use pellets and you use the right, the, the normal ingredients. What I had, this mm -hmm. is what I had in mind in the, in the slide. Um, how often do you recommend mineral analysis for your ingredients? Um, and this is general to maybe both Tom and to Andreas. And um, what about forages or feedstuffs not included in the, the library, the feed library values? Tom. No, I was going to say, go ahead, Andreas. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, minerals and vitamins. Practically, if we analyze them uh, once per year, I think it will be fine. No, they are quite expensive to analyze. Uh, almost no one is doing that in, uh, in Greece, for example, okay? Um, now about feeds that we don't have in the feed library, we need to characterize them and add them, no, Tom? For, for the mineral, for the, for the, for the vitamins, Absolutely, but 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 I don't know anyone that analyzes any feeds for minerals, uh, for vitamins. I mean, um, for minerals, um, I'll I'll say this. You know, within a crop like corn silage, oh, once or twice a year uh, for that crop year for for wet chem minerals. It is definitely the minimum uh, for concentrates. Um, 
You know, the, the probably one of the most variable ones is uh, uh, calcium content of, of soybean meal uh, because it, 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 it does vary. Uh, and you can tell that it, it, you can tell that a little bit by the protein level. Um, and that's a manu that's because of manufacturing of soybean meal. Uh, it would, it's good to do those, you know, from a company level a few times a year, at least, or new suppliers, or, you know, if you're in Europe and you get a shipload of soybean meal, then yeah, a couple times through that shipload. Um, the, the, the ones to really be careful of is when we get into forages, if we see high ash levels, uh, for example, um, an alfalfa that's greater than 10% ash, uh, that's telling us that there's a lot of soil contamination and, and some of those trace minerals uh, will be artificially inflated uh, because they, that, for example, copper, it may be there, but if it's in the soil component, it's not digestible. Uh, so, so there's, there's definitely things that, that to, to keep in mind when doing that. Um, the good news is, you know, within the EU, uh, there is a lab in Italy that's doing minerals by X, X-ray. Uh, that is, is their calibrations are quite good. Uh, there's a, another lab, a major lab uh, that is uh, going to be offering all of their minerals by ICP now. Um, that's a commercial lab. Um, and it's really when we get into the rest of the world where we start running into problems with availability of wet chem analysis for minerals. Uh, Europe's coming along quickly. The US, North America's, uh, we have plenty of options, uh, but when we get into uh, some of the other countries, um, that availability gets, gets tricky. Um, but it's well worth when you look at the, the economics of, of mineral supplementation and by reducing, being able to reduce our mineral supplements uh, to better match uh, the requirements on a specific herd or flock versus uh, uh, just assuming that there's nothing there and we way overfeed it. Uh, there's a huge economic benefit of, of doing wet chem mineral analysis. Uh, okay, th thanks, Tom. Um, and and those results wouldn't necessarily be available in the Dairy One Forage Laboratory feed database, would it? Um, that's a good place to start because the only thing, especially the trace minerals, uh, that they would be reporting there would be done by ICP. Okay, thank you. I have to ask this question because it sounds so much like a Holstein guy talking about jerseys. This person wants to know if goats are licking steel gates and chains, is this an indication of a mineral shortage or is it just the annoying behavior God gave? <laughs> <laughs> My reaction to that's going to be they're goats. They're like jerseys. They'll eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times I've seen people, uh, it sounds crazy, but, but um, you know, because we can say the same thing about heifers and it doesn't matter what breed, they have nothing to do. So they get bored. So they start doing crazy stuff. And, and I've seen people, especially with goats, put toys in with, with a group, um, be it a ball, be it something for them to climb on, something for them to express their natural social behavior to that that will reduce the, this uh, um, uh, inappropriate behavior. 
I, I prefer to assume it's an indication of superior intelligence, but... Stereotypic behavior of the goat is called, no? <laughs> or it can be a deficiency. To be honest, it can be both. You, do, you, you never know. But yes, they are, they are like crazy animals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, questions about specific commodities like corn, gluten, feed, cotton, or other type com commodities. Uh, no, I mean, as long as they fit in the ratio and it is in a normal range, let's say normal from, from the cows, I don't think we will face any big, big issue with the goat. Okay, back to, um, do you need to be, take into account the form of the mineral in the diet and its effect on assimilation or digestibility? Tom? Um, Wait, say that, read that one again? Yeah. Um, does the mineral balance take into account the form of the mineral in the diet, which affects its assimilation or digestibility, like a mineralized salt, salt versus a forage or organic matter-based mineral? So that, that's the, that's one of the, that is one of the nice things with um, uh, wherever possible in the, in the mineral requirement calculations, uh, bioavailabilities of the different minerals, different ingredients has been implemented. Uh, that, that's not available for all the different minerals, but where it's possible uh, that, that has been implemented. So it does take into account some of, the, some of those differences in digestibilities uh, between forage concentrates and, and different types of mineral supplements, BM oxide, sulfates, uh, glycinates, uh, any organic complex. And, 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 and again, with all of that though, uh, we're gonna be using uh, for the most part cow data on, on those products uh, because there's, I don't know of any company that's looked at bioavailabilities of, of different mineral sources within small ruminants. And um, again, and this, uh, this goes again to the lack of information, perhaps. Um, do you consider the rumen starch digestibilities that you um, consider as it sort of based off the recommendations for dairy cows? The fast answer is yes. No? Um. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, there is one question about acidosis from uh, alpha, yes, alpha pellet. Yes, sorry, that was next. I, before you go to that, Andreas, I just want to say in the program, um, if you look under the feeds screen, you can find a place where the bio avail availabilities is, is laid out on each feed or each mineral. Okay. But so go ahead. Um, the question is, are there um, acidogenic results with alfalfa pellets? In, uh, I feel safe to use uh, alpha alpha pellets as long as the whole diet is balanced. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm present, presently out of questions. Um, do you want to go over some more things, Andreas? You started to go through sort of some indications of what you look like on that ration output screen and what ranges you're thinking of. Um, do we want to re return back to that or um, where are we on, on where, where we want to be? No, I, I, I think we, uh, uh, I'm, let, let's let Andreas work on that. Uh, I, I, put, I put him on the spot doing that and, and yes. I'm bad about that. So let, let, let's let him work on that um, and then get it to us because that also addresses, you know, a comment that Mike Shearing made about, uh, uh, having uh, a document that, that talks about the, recommend, the diet recommendations. Um, I, I think we structured this around that. I think that would be very good. So Andreas can do that later. That would be perfect. We have a, we have a recommendations for um, cows and it would be wonderful if we put together and I think we have plans for the same sort of thing with um, 
dairy goats and and sheep too. Um, we're going to bring this back up, I guess, because maybe maybe the question wasn't um, heard well. Um, how do you adapt the ration, ration for heat stress? You said that goats generally don't have it. Do you need to do anything? I mean, you. I mean, if you have a ratio that is about the, the dry matter of the TMR is very important. So if you have it balanced and it's about between 40 and 60, you don't need to do any adaptations for heat stress. If it is above 60, then probably adding water, it is a good strategy, okay? Just to make it uh, better for, for the animals. I know that sometimes when you add water, you may increase the temperature of the TMR. Okay, but this is a risk that we need to, to, to take into consideration. Do you but look at minerals or bicarb at all in those sort of situations? During heat stress is the question. Yeah, yeah. I guess the, the, the one to follow up on that would be, uh, because this would probably be the most applicable uh, thing uh, related to heat stress, uh, would be... Uh, has any uh, has anyone done any work, Andreas, with DCAD in in goats? I, not of uh, what I know. I'm yeah. not aware of any of any study like this. I don't know. I, I'm not either, and, and that would probably be uh, the critical one. Uh, you know, let, let me let me address this heat stress one a little bit. Um, I I used to look at. at changing diets when I knew we were going to be getting into heat stress and, and all of this stuff. And after a few years of doing that, I was like, you know, th this is kind of stupid because what we're really trying to do when, when we're, we're changing those diets is, is to try and uh, increase, you know, concentrations of especially energy, go to more fat, anything to try and overcome the depression and in intake. And it really never worked well. And, and, and then it hit me, it's our, our single most important component with this related to heat stress <coughs> is really not any different than dealing with cold stress or thermoneutral. Feed a healthy diet, keep the diet healthy, and then it's all about anything we can do to try and maintain intake, be it the correct moisture level of, of, of the TMR, be it um, changing what time of day we may feed, um, knowing how animals will respond when it's cooling off. If the TMR is getting hot, maybe adding something like, like uh, 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 propionic acid or calcium propionate to, to try and keep the TMR from secondary heating. Then again, focus on why that TMR is heating. That's a, that's a silage management problem. And after that, it's all about heat stress abatement. How do we cool these animals down? Be it shade, be it fans, water, anything. We cannot feed ourselves out of heat stress. Can I say something general for the, the people that are here? I mean, a lot of them are, uh, are feeding goats or sheep, okay? And we are making an effort here to develop a data set to evaluate the model and to see the mistakes of the model and to see what we need to fix later on in the model. This is very important. If we don't have a good evaluation, we don't know where the problems are. So they do have data from their own farms and probably they can communicate with us and see how we can use this data that they have in the whole evaluation. Right now we are doing some trials in three farms, sheep farms, sheep dairy farms. And we are going to feed, not right now, the next month we are going to start, we are going to feed different ratios in order to get uh, data for the evaluation. So if someone has already from, uh, from one, two, three farms data, they can communicate with me or Tom and we can, we can clean up the data and see if we can use it for the evaluation. That's very important. And another important aspect is those that are formulating with AMTS and they see problems or mistakes or bugs or everything they should they if they can they can 
they can communicate this with us, it will be great. Andreas, uh, thank you. I, I, I'm sorry, I apparently have an unstable internet connection, so I keep um, losing you. There was a question and you may have answered it when I couldn't hear you. Um, what are your recommendations for bicarbonate and salt levels without regard to heat stress? I mean, the stud, the, I don't have a specific recommendations for uh, salt levels in many cases are quite high already in the diet. Okay, thank you. Carbonate we need to use like five, 10 grams will be okay for, uh, for dairy goats. If, we, again, I'm saying that we are talking about intensive systems with high concentrate diets, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, a question about alfalfa pellets again, is effective fiber, fiber less of a concern in dairy goats compared with cows? Okay, my, 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 probably Tom will disagree. My opinion, both in cows and uh, small ruminants is that effective fiber, the effective NDF is not a very good indicator. I prefer the UNDF or the total NDF and the degradation and in most, not in most, in, in all of my formulations, I don't even look the physical effective NDF. I don't know if Tom disagrees with that. No, with goats, goats are just, I, and beyond that, even for cows, I'm looking at something more closely uh, that's not PENDF lately, but that we're not talking cows. So yeah, goat, goats, we don't have any data on, on PENDF on goats. So total NDFs, forage NDFs, like you do, Andreas is, the best way to go. Okay, um, I do not have questions. <clears throat> Are there any guidelines on demographics on commercial herds, for example, dry matter intake, what dry matter intake would allow For the prime and how much milk costs. So I got also the email from, from Eric about the days in milk and the open days, if I remember correct. Yeah, days in milk. Sorry, I yeah. did a little bit of dyslexia there. Okay, I, to be honest, I, and I wanted to communicate with him, I don't really understand the discussion about days open in, in, in goats. Uh, so the, the reproduction period on goats, the, it's not during the transition period, like after the transition period, like in, in, uh, in early lactation, let's say like in, in, in cows. So we have, if we have a cycle of 12 months, we need to go five months before and start the, the reproduction. So why do we care about open days in this case? I mean, it's, it's theoretically, it's not a problem in goats, no? Okay. If, um, if Eric wants to communicate and say something, I mean, it's. I would like to have his his yeah his his feedback and see what what he's thinking because probably I didn't understand well the 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 question in his email again. I, I read it a couple of times and it was quite difficult for me to understand the situation that he's into. Oh, oh I, I I think I think Eric, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think where you're going is uh, we know like in in. Uh, uh, dairy cows, Andreas, that, that herds that, that maintain uh, an average days of milk of 150 to 160 uh, tend to be the higher producing herds and the more profitable herds uh, instead of herds at 200 days in milk. Yes, but goats are seasonal, no? Oh, it's not right. all year calving. Okay. Or they, or they shouldn't be all year calving, no? I think I, we have benchmarks and I think he's maybe looking at what um, might be the benchmarks in, in dairy goats. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. Good question, Eric. Um, let's see, I know that we talked about this very briefly, but could you go over it again? Um, Uh, 
I don't know if it is my internet, but no, I don't hear you. All right, so let, let, let's go with this one I, because I think this is a good one. Um, uh, what are your recommendations? Yeah, we didn't talk at all about uh, dry doughs. Or doughs like that three to four weeks pre kidding Andreas. Yes, I don't. I didn't prepare anything for. Okay. For this. Okay. Here's, I like this one too. I mean, generally speaking, in the, in the dry the dry season, the dry period, you need to feed a lot of forats and uh, you supplement them with a little bit of concentrate the last month. That's that's the general approach that we have. We, yeah, I, and that's, I think that that's an area of research that would be cool too. What if we manipulated MP levels in that that last month, uh, and what impact would that have on on uh, dough production post kidding? Uh, I I don't know of any any work that's been done looking at at really how to feed the, the, those transition does uh, in, in terms of maximizing health and maximizing future production. I think it's safe to say that there's a lot of work that could be done with small ruminants. And, and that's why I like this question. Uh, what would you say is the area that is most lacking or needs the most understanding uh, for on-farm uh, application? Everything we run behind behind the dairy cows uh, research. No, I mean, I don't know. Ninety five percent of the things that we consider standard in a dairy cow, we don't implement them in dairy goats, and we don't really know. Okay, not ninety five percent, like sixty percent of that. So there is a, a huge need to do specific research for goats because sometimes we just implement what we know from cows or what we know from sheep but these are not the same animals. So there are a lot of things. And in the discussion, I already said that even how low can we go on NDF or how high can we go with starts? We don't really know it from, from data set, okay? We don't have a meta-analysis on that, a, a real, a good meta-analysis. And if we go further, we will see that most of the literature is based on traditional systems and not intensive system, except the research that is done in, in France in the Mediterranean area, in Greece, in Italy, in Spain, we are talking about the traditional breeds, the local breeds, that they are low producing breeds in semi-intensive systems in the best case, but in the majority of that is with low producing goats. So it's not the same. We cannot take this and implement it to a high producing uh, dairy goat. So there are a lot of things that we can see. Pick your pick. Pick one that you would think would be the highest impact. UNDF levels challenge the the gold for UNDF and NDF. I think I, I, will... I, I like that because that goes along with the stuff that Rick Grant's been doing at Minor, and and it goes back to an earlier discussion about PENDF and and the part in the NDF levels and the particle size in relation to rumination time, and, and then that that what we've learned with cows recently it's not it's not rumination time that changes that much when we have normal diets uh, and we change particle size we're actually changing eating time Her, the amount of time that she has to chew to reduce the particles to a size that she can swallow and, and that's probably going to be even more applicable in in goats and sheep um, given their, their, especially goats, their, their ability to sort against large particles and fines. Uh, and how can we get more, it's the same as the cows, we're limited by how much fermentable carbohydrates we can stuff down their throats every day. And anything we can do to maximize that or help her maximize that intake is, is going to be of utmost importance. And, and this whole relationship with UNDFs is, is critical 
in, in those conversations. So I, I'm I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you. That's good, no? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there is another yeah. question. Oh, okay, here you are, Maria. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I I got ditched. My my internet is terrible apparently today. Um, uh, there's some questions on recommendations for peak of lactation and macro minerals and and all of these things. Is this something you want to actually work on and put together that we can send out? And I'm a, I apologize if you answered these and I missed it. No, 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 that's, that's, that's fine. Yes, we need to develop some recommendations. I mean, the driving force there after the peak of lactation is milk yield, how, how high it is. Uh, there is another question about microminerals and if we can have guidelines for that, for, micro, for, for minerals. And again, the answer is yes, okay, we don't have. And in dairy goats, what we do, at least in Greece, that I know for 100%, is that we use the same guidelines for dairy sheep. We take the guidelines for dairy sheep and we use it for dairy goat as well. So specific ones we don't have, that will be a nice thing to do and try to develop something. Well, the NRC and INRA ha do have some. There's there's a sum in the NRC that that are that cover both species, but for the most part, um, they, they they do have different recommendations for uh, all minerals um, but that are that differ for sheep, goats, dry does, lactating does, uh, growing kids. Um, so that, that's a good place to start. And I, I think that's, that is, um, uh, that, that we get into formulating mineral premixes, uh, mineral supplements for these kids. It's, we, we need to be using, I think what's in the NRC and what, what, what INRA has is definitely the place that we need to start from. Okay, th thank you. Did you um, answer the percentage of barley and corn used in a ration? No, but I, but I can. I mean, Leonidas, oh, okay. I, I don't like to put limits, okay? You put the limits based on the forages that you are feeding. So you cannot be 10, 20, 30, 50%. Depends on the, on the forage, the basic forage, if it is corn silage or alfalfa hay and the amount of that forage and then the needs of the cows. There is not a specific limit on how much uh, barley or corn you can add in the diet. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, based on what you mentioned earlier in the presentation, a physically effective part at 0.3 millimeters or 1.2 millimeters, which? <clears throat> Uh, again, I will say that I don't like the physical effective fiber uh, approach. Okay, uh, theoretically, I think based on what we the, the recommendations that we have in Greece about the the particle size, yes, probably this is the the amount. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, any more questions from anyone or comments, Tom? and Andreas. I, I just want to say thank you for everyone coming. This has been, uh, and thank you, Andreas. These, these have been really, really good. And, and I, I think everyone is, can, everyone can clearly see and everyone knows, we know the level of frustration people have with, with trying to get recommendations for goats and sheep. And trust us, we all share in, in that because there is an overall lack of data. Um, and we're trying, we're trying that that's, that's why we're so happy to have Andreas, uh, working with us on, on this because he, he's kind of leading the charge, uh, in a lot of ways with, with, with goats in relation to the model. Um, and, uh, I see we've been losing some people. So I just want to quickly say thank you everyone for, for joining us and, and happy holidays. Um, and, and I'll let uh, Marianne and Andreas continue now. Yes, okay. the only thing that I want to say is, is that, uh, Tom, the big problem that we are facing is that we are mainly this new 
in commerce, let's say in the in the field of dairy goats, are mainly interested on uh, intensive systems, and the intensive system, especially in the Mediterranean, is something new. And there is a lot of data there. There is a lot of research done in Greece, Spain, Italy, France about goats. France is the only exception that has high producing goats. Spain is going there. Okay, Greece not really. And the big problem in developing uh, guidelines is that you take all this information that you have in, in extensive systems and you try to apply them in intensive. And this is the biggest mistake that you can do, this is my opinion. So we need to generate more data, that's, that's for sure. And we have some answers here that a lot of people are willing to collaborate with uh, and, and, and share data that they have in their own farms, and this is excellent. Yes, and Andreas, one of the things that we've talked about, um, Lynn and I and Tom and everybody in the AMTS team, is developing um, a Facebook group that would sort of serve as a forum. We're, we're working on that, and that is an area that we would be soon having maybe just a sheep and goat focused Facebook book group where people can do some exchange like this. So I think it's a great idea um, that we have a, 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 a cattle one and a small ruminant one, Marianne. Yes. Yes, that's that's an excellent idea. All right. Um, so unless we have questions and um, anything more that anybody wants to say, this has been great. A lot of questions are, are always um, wonderful in a webinar on much. I think I'm hitting most of these. Um, I do have a person who contacted me and I'll talk to her about an academic, um, the, an, an, an academic thing. So the, just know that the Facebook um, page is going to be something that's for our so it'll be by invitation and it'll be kind of closely monitored so we don't get um, people in there that are just disruptors. So just be aware of that. You'll, you'll find out more information in the email that later. Um, so does anyone have any further questions? I think we're, Andreas, thank you. Tom. Okay, thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for the invitation and for uh, generating all this nice discussion. Um, uh, I know that in mo many cases I didn't have a direct answer because there is no direct answer so far. And uh, I'm looking forward to further communication with people that are working with dairy goats. Thank you very much. Yes, and we'll, um, we'll continue receiving some follow-up emails and maybe we can keep the discussion going between everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, don't hesitate to send us some questions or um, ish, anything you might want to know. Just thanks very much. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Thank you everybody who joined. Bye. Have a good day, everybody. You too. Bye, everybody. Bye.